Thank you very much. Uh, as you heard, I, uh, I ought to begin by acknowledging uh, that my presence here tonight uh, constitutes my first serious connection with the Speech and Communication Association, and I have little doubt that the SCA will uh, survive the encounter. I have even less doubt, by the way, that, that I will be the chief beneficiary of this encounter, especially because I plan to stay around long enough to hear people other than myself do some talking. And this is not said, uh, by the way, as a ritualistic self-deprecation. As you'll hear in a moment, my colleagues, the students, and I at NYU are engaged in a kind of a perilous adventure in the field of communication. And we really do need the advice and empathetic criticism and psychic support that only the members of this organization are qualified to give. And so, though I'm uh, the keynote speaker at your conference, I come not to bring you the word, which I don't have, but rather a whole bunch of question marks, which probably you don't need. Nevertheless, I do so really in the sincere hope that some of you, by knowing about our situation, might be able to help us find uh, our way to a few creative solutions. Now, specifically, what I'd like to do is tell you about the foolhardy, presumptuous, and exhilarating effort we're making at NYU to elaborate a new perspective for studying communication, one that might still make some sense uh, 20 or 30 years from now. In, in effect, what we're trying to do is work within a new structure for understanding the communication process, a structure that reflects the powerful trend toward reorganizing knowledge <clears throat> that is associated with the ecological perspective. Now, as you may be aware, uh, universities are not always sympathetic to such reorganizing efforts, perhaps uh, because with age, they suffer from hardening of the categories. As uh, Kenneth Boulding says in his, in his wonderful book, The Image, it will be a long time before the restructuring of knowledge, which now seems to be underway, will be reflected in the organization of universities. Indeed, it is difficult to visualize now exactly what the appropriate organization might be. But there can be little doubt that this restructuring will eventually have to be recognized officially. Until then, the new structures, as new structures have always done, will have to live in an underworld, an underworld of deviant professors, gifted amateurs, and moderate crackpots. And folks, <clears throat> well, I'd like to skip the question as to which of these categories uh, I most rightly belong. It's enough to say that at the School of Education at NYU, a most hospitable reception has been given to those of us who have shown a serious interest in doing something unusual in communication. At almost every turn, encouragement has been freely offered by administrators and faculty. And we have even been allowed to invent a new name for our subject, Media Ecology. And one of the more delightful rewards we have reaped so far is in the fact that both our name and our course of study, such as it is, were adopted whole by Oxford University last summer. We were encouraged, too, by the fact that Harvard University published this year the final report of its program on technology and society. Since that program was established to begin inquiries into many of the same matters we at NYU are concerned with, well, we've almost begun to feel that we're part of the official knowledge establishment. As many of you know, even those in the academic underworld need stroking and to receive positive reinforcement from the two greatest universities in the Western world, well, it's almost too much to bear. 
But one must do more than bear it. One must be suspicious of it. All the Oxfords and Harvards and NYUs in the world cannot change the fact that communication as a science and or discipline just barely exists, if it exists at all. And I think our colleagues from more settled disciplines are right in viewing us with circumspection. As Gregory Bateson put it in his book, Steps to an Ecology of Mind, those of us in communication are explorers. And he said, in the nature of the case, an explorer can never know what he is exploring until it has been explored, unquote. Well, among other things, that implies that an exploration can, after all, end up badly. And I do not mean by badly that you start out looking for spice in China and end up in Puerto Rico. I mean your ship may quite easily hit a rock as you leave the harbor and sink within sight of shore. <laughs> You never know at the beginning if you'll find glory and riches or end up a laughing stock in Davy Jones' locker. But an explorer does at least have a plan and sometimes a great notion. Well, at NYU, we may not have a great notion or even a plan, but we certainly have a starting point. Now, what that starting point is can be stated in a number of ways. But I'm especially partial to its expression in kinesics and context by Ray Birdwhistle. <clears throat> this is what he says. A human being is not a black box with one orifice for emitting a chunk of stuff called communication and another for receiving it. And at the same time, communication is not simply the sum of the bits of information which pass between two people in a given period of time." Unquote. Now, it seems to me that as long as communication is conceived of as a chunk of stuff moving this way and that in countable quanta, there is probably no need for a new approach to communication or any approach for that matter. Each of several academic disciplines, for example, physics, linguistics, psychology, sociology, literary criticism, semantics, and logic, can supply a language and a perspective to describe pieces of the chunk. But once an atomistic view of communication is rejected, and in its place is substituted an ecological view, you have an entirely new set of problems for which there are no readily available conceptual handles. What you need, when it comes right down to it, is a new paradigm. Now, I think you know that a paradigm is a perspective or a model or even a metaphor that serves to define the legitimate problems and appropriate methods of a field of study. Aristotle's physics, Newton's optics, Franklin's electricity, and Lavoisier's chemistry were such paradigms. Each of them gave rise to a scholarly tradition and permitted the passage into maturity of each of their respective fields. But history, I think, tells us that the road to a firm paradigm consensus is extremely arduous and this is especially so in the social sciences. Take psychology, for example. At the present time, so far as I can tell, there are at least three important paradigms competing to preempt the field. First, there's the tradition begun by Watson and Hull, but which is now known as Skinnerian. Second, there is the tradition known as Freudian. And third, there is the relative newcomer called Rogerian or Maslovian. But each paradigm has its faithful adherents who seem to look with disdain on those who are faithful to the others. Each paradigm starts from a different set of postulates 
and has a unique language. Freudians talk about instincts, Rogerians about needs, and Skinnerians about contingencies. They barely understand each other, and I don't think they want to. Now, I think somewhat the same situation exists in the field of communication, where we have several similar paradigms, each with its own special language and adherence. I'm sure we're all familiar with the Shannon, Weaver, Norbert Wiener paradigm, which talks about communication in terms of such peculiar words as noise, redundancy, information overload, and feedback. And I assume we also know about the bird whistle paradigm, which uses the methodology and some of the language of structural linguistics as a basis for describing nonverbal behavior, or as he calls it, kinesics. Then there's uh, Irving Goffman's paradigm, which he calls a dramaturgical model because he likens interpersonal transactions to theatrical presentations. And then there's also the McLuhan-Jacques Ellul paradigm, in which all human behavior is understood as a function of the dominant communication technologies of a culture. Well, there are, of course, a dozen others that anyone in this room could probably name, including those of Eric Byrne, David Berlow, Harold Glasswell, and Edward Hall. Now, in reviewing these paradigms as thoroughly as we were able, which incidentally is an education all by itself, it occurred to us that each one of them was seriously limited in one respect or another. Some are merely special cases of larger paradigms. Some are based on purely atomistic assumptions. And most are unable to cope with the full range of communication transactions that we might want to know something about. Information theory, for example, is very useful in looking into machine, machine communication. But it is, first of all, based on a mechanistic input-output metaphor, and is second, I think, next to useless in describing human communication. Goffman's dramaturgical metaphor is quite promising in a number of ways, but it is actually a special case of the role-playing paradigm, and it has nothing to say about men and their technologies. Now, McLuhan has plenty to say about that, of course, but almost nothing sensible about anything else. Moreover, I think his methods are so idiosyncratic that anyone wishing to use his paradigm would hardly know how to behave himself, scientifically speaking. So what we have tried to do is select a paradigm, in this case a metaphor, that would reflect a holistic perspective that would comprehend all communication transactions and that would be useful in organizing research into the widest variety of communication situations. Now, the metaphor we chose, as you might infer from the name media ecology, is, of course, that all communication is an environment. Now, by adopting this perspective, we are not only rejecting the idea that communication is a chunk of stuff, but also the idea that communication takes place in an environment. What we are putting forward is the idea that communication is an environment, from which we have concluded that the study of communication is or should be one of the ecological sciences. Now, I don't suppose that this metaphor will strike any of you as especially startling. Every one of us has probably come across it before. For example, Edward Hall is not far from it. And Marshall McLuhan probably means something like it when he says that the medium is the message. 
Ray Birdwistle certainly does when he defines communication as, quote, that system through which human beings establish a predictable continuity in life, unquote. But what's distinctive, we think, in what we're trying to do at NYU is that we've assembled a community of teachers and students who have committed themselves to rigorously exploring the ecological paradigm to see how far it can take us and in what directions. By rigorously exploring, I mean that in all our research, in all our courses, in all our discussions, and in all our writing, much of which, incidentally, is contained in our publication, The Media Ecology Review. We start from the premise that every communication system and process is connected with every other communication system and process in a complex network, and that the study of communication processes is the study not of elements, but of elements in relationship. Thus, our attention is focused not on who says what to whom, through what medium, etc., but on how the who, what, whom, and medium are interrelated. From the ecological perspective, content analysis, for example, is viewed as either trivial or irrelevant. What matters to us is context. And to the extent that media ecology has as yet a methodology, that methodology might be called context analysis. Now this implies looking at communication environments as systems within systems within systems. It means trying to identify the significant characteristics of each system as a whole the subsystems of which it is composed, the larger system within which it functions, and all the significant relationships among them. And to make things even more confusing, context analysis takes as its subject matter the transactions between individual and reality, between individual and individual, individual and group, group and group, group and culture, and culture and culture, and tries to see all of these as functions of one another. Moreover, context analysis, or media ecology, gives special attention to the roles played in each of these transactions by the media through which they are conducted. By media, we mean any agent or agency through which two or more discrete elements are linked in a transacting system. Communications media include, therefore, both technologies like film, radio, and television, and techniques which are media composed of a set of procedures. I suppose one might call techniques soft media although they are no less compelling than technology itself. The technique known as operant conditioning, for example, is a medium which links behavior A to behavior B. Parliamentary procedure is a medium connecting event A to event B. And the medium known as Aristotelian logic links statement A to statement B. Thus, from our point of view, a technology or a technique is an environment within an environment. Now, to try to give you a concrete illustration, because I think that's what's needed, of how context analysis works, let me choose the environment you and I presently find ourselves in. Now, to begin with, I'm reluctant to give this environment a name because by naming it, I will prejudice the analysis. For example, if I call this environment the keynote address, or 
even Postman's keynote address, I would impose on it the tacit assumption that the content of Postman's words is probably the most important element in the environment, which is quite probably not true, by the way. Moreover, by naming the environment, the keynote address, I would effectively obscure the role that the addressees have played in making the address what it is. And not only that, by calling it Postman's Address, I might foster the impression that the role you play is essentially passive, a matter of merely recording what I say which is, of course, not what is actually happening. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on this point beyond observing that the name one gives to the system one is looking at usually turns out to be an element in the system itself because it always gives some degree of direction to the observations one will make. Let's say, then, that this environment is our keynote address and leave it at that. Although a good media ecologist would never leave it at that because one of his first concerns is to specify the effects of his own behavior as an observer, including his naming behavior on the system he's observing. In any case, one of the first questions we now have to ask is what is the largest system of which this environment is only a part and what is the relationship between them? Well, obviously, this system is part of the larger environment called the ninth Annual SCA Summer Conference. And the apparent function of this speech is to mark the beginning of the larger event. Now, this fact calls attention to an invariable characteristic of all communication environments, namely that they all have boundaries, more or less arbitrary dividing lines signifying the end of one system and the beginning of another. College graduation ceremonies, doctoral orals, and wedding ceremonies are boundary markers of the most obvious and formalized kind. Dressing for dinner Signing in at conventions and events like this speech are boundary markers of a more subtle kind. But they all serve the same function, and that is to define the environment one is about to enter. They signal, in effect, that a certain set of behaviors and not others are in order. But one of the important functions of our keynote address, then, is to mark the boundary between conference and non-conference. Now, this seemingly simple observation suggests a number of interesting questions. Among them this. If this event is primarily a boundary marker, is it the most effective structure that can be found to do the job? Well, of course, to answer that question, one would have to answer the question what is the function of the larger system, the ninth annual SCA Summer Conference? Now that, I'm sure, is a very complex question because depending on who you are, the answers will be very different. They will range from, I've always wanted to go to Chicago, <laughs> to it's good to have this on my record, to let's get away from the kids for a weekend, do I need some contacts for a job? All very good purposes. I doubt, incidentally, that the formally stated purpose for holding this conference is the compelling reason for bringing most of us here. The formal declaration of purpose is more in the nature of what media ecologists would call a binding strategy, or for short, BS. <laughs> now, nevertheless, one of the functions of the conference as a whole 
is to serve as a boundary marker within a larger system. For example, this conference draws a line between those of us who are committed speech communication professionals and those ordinary standard brand slobs who stay home. <laughs> Whatever the specific functions of a particular professional conference may be, the communication system known as a convention has certain structural characteristics as a whole that I think are worth noting because they serve to explain much of the behavior that takes place inside the system. For instance, in examining other convention environments, I have come to the conclusion that they are apt to be quite weird in that they are almost entirely closed systems. That is, environments that are not truly connected to any larger systems. It is almost as if conventions hover in a world of their own, beginning, middling, and ending, leaving memories but few consequences. <laughs> now this is why, I imagine, so much hyperbole and fantasizing goes on at conventions <laughs> and occurs in all of the convention subsystems, hotel bars, hotel rooms, the keynote address, workshops, restaurants, wherever the convention is gather. The closest parallel, by the way, that I can find to the communication environment of a convention is the system that is created on airplanes when passengers engage in complex transactions. That environment begins when you enter the plane and ends when you leave it and except in rare cases, has no relationship to other systems within which passengers must function. That is why I believe so many people tell outrageous stories about themselves to other passengers. <laughs> One need fear only internal contradictions. There, there are no... There are no external implications. And that is also why I think the tales and fantasies and flirtations in which one may engage on an airplane may be regarded as harmless. The same is true for the tales, fantasies, and flirtations in which one may engage at a convention. Because for all of their differences, the airplane as an environment and the convention as an environment are structurally quite similar in that their boundaries are extraordinarily well-defined, almost, in fact, impenetrable. As environments, they are self-contained. Now, this characteristic of conventions helps to achieve certain purposes. It promotes, for example, a strong sense of group identity and loyalty, but at the same time, it precludes other purposes. For example, the carryover of convention spirit and learning into the less exotic systems in which we function back home. Now, of course, no communication environment is so completely closed that its boundaries cannot be breached. Although, in general, the more isolated the system is, from its supra system, the more extreme the behavior with, within it must be to break through the boundaries. And such breaks, when they do occur, are almost always traumatic. To shift the context for just a moment, I think this is in part what the Watergate scandal is about. What Holderman, Mitchell, Ehrlichman, and Dean did was to create a closed communication environment which accounts in part for the intense team spirit and loyalties of which they all speak. But as their behavior became increasingly bizarre, it was inevitable that their system would be penetrated by searching inquiries from those in the larger systems surrounding the White House. The trauma that resulted 
broke the closed system to pieces, destroyed all the coordination of its elements, and made it into a junk pile rather than a system. One might even say that the entire problem of the present administration is that it assumed that the presidency was a closed system. But to come back to our present situation, I want to point out that the relative openness or closedness of any system varies for different participants by virtue of their position and function within the system. My own position and function in this environment, for instance, imposes certain definite restrictions on the number and quality of the fantasies I may create, simply because if someone records my remarks or asks for a copy of my talk, I am immediately faced with the possibility of being drawn into some larger system of which this convention is only a part. I'm not saying, by the way, that I am therefore creating no fantasies, <laughs> but only that I am aware that my behavior in this environment is governed in part by my relationship to larger systems. Now, so is yours, of course, but probably to a somewhat lesser extent, unless you choose to do something bizarre. For example, if you should fall asleep within the next five minutes, the chances are that your behavior will not have implications much beyond this room. If, however, you should stand up, remove your clothes, and announce that you are going for a swim, I should not be surprised if your wife or your dean or even your mother would eventually learn of it. <laughs> now, should any of you do this, by the way, Here's what we'd say about it as media ecologists. <laughs> that you have, first of all, misconceived the structure and function of this environment. <laughs> that you have misread the boundary markers. <laughs> that you are an element, so to speak, that has rejected being part of the available subsystems within this environment. And that your action will change all the relationships of all the other elements in the environment in such a way, I suspect, as to render the original environment untenable. You would, in short, have created a traumatic system break. Or to use another ecological metaphor, you would have polluted the environment beyond its capacity to regenerate itself. <laughs> unless, unless, of course, you do this now. In which case, none of what I just said will be true. <laughs> In other words, now that I have mentioned and discussed the possibility of such behavior, the meaning of your doing it will be entirely different from what it might have been before. The context, you see, always determines the significance of the content. But the context of any communication environment is only partly defined by the larger system in which it functions. It is also defined by the smaller systems which make up the environment and the relationships among them. Now, this leads to the question, what are the subsystems that comprise our present environment. Well, I am myself an obvious subsystem, and so are you. And if we inquire into both our purposes for being here and our functions in this system, we will undoubtedly uncover, uncover important information about the environment as a whole. For example, from a functional point of view, it wouldn't make much difference if I fall asleep in the next five minutes or take off my clothes. Either way, I induce a traumatic system break. In other words, the variations in the functions of subsystems explain the range of permissible behaviors within the environment. 
Moreover, when we ask about the effects of our physical arrangement, including the vantage points from which we see or hear each other, we learn still more about this environment. And when we inquire into the technologies that are part of this environment, whether it's the microphone in front of me, or this tape recorder, or a tape recorder you might hold, we learn still more about what this environment is all about, and how it's shaping up, and how it's shaping us. For instance, how would I be different if, if I were being videotaped? How would you be different if you were watching a videotape of me instead of me in the flesh? Would you be offended? Would you be more engrossed? Would I seem to speak with more authority? Would you feel more free to talk to the person next to you? And if so, how would that affect your relationship with the other people around you now and with me? And what is the most effective medium to use in this environment in order to link you and me and everyone else here in a single system with a common goal? Now that last question is especially fascinating to media ecologists, and we have been most concerned to find out something about the relationship between the people in a communication environment and the technologies that are part of that environment. Since most of you are teachers, I think, I'm sure you've noticed, for example, that the fastest possible way to lose the coordinated attention of a group is to pass out written materials while you are talking. Now, print is the isolating medium par excellence. It appears to create a special environment all its own, resulting in the temporary suspension of all the imperatives of larger communication of, uh, environments around it. And there's no point either in telling your audience not to look at the printed material until you have finished talking. So far as we have been able to determine, for most people, print will win the competition for attention with speech in most contexts. And perhaps that's why most teachers insist on reading aloud to students whatever is contained in printed material they hand out. They must intuitively sense that the only way to maintain control over a print environment is to superimpose on it their own voice. I might add here, uh, by the way, and in case you're interested, that our initial research indicates that in the competition among media for people's attention, the telephone wins hands down in just about every context. We even have testimony to the fact that the act of love can be terminated instantly by the ring of a telephone. <laughs> now, in, in media ecology, we call this telephonus interruptus. <laughs> now, less... <laughs> less serious, less serious but equally revealing is the fact that on two occasions in the past year, according to news reports, bank robbers in the actual process of being surrounded by police took time out to answer phone calls placed <laughs> by curious reporters. And one of the bank robbers actually said, and I'm not making this up, could you call back later on the visit? <laughs> Now this question, how does technology affect human perception, feeling, and value, has been almost a preoccupation with us. It is difficult enough to analyze a complex communication environment 
such as this keynote speech, or a courtroom, or a classroom, or a business office. But at least in such environments, <clears throat> the rules of interaction are usually quite explicit and sometimes even formally stated. However, in the case of technologically created environments, that is the relationship between people and their radios, films, television, telephones, computers, and the like, the rules of interaction are mostly hidden from view and are next to impossible to uncover. This is probably due to the fact that we are so easily distracted by the content of these media. The compelling question always seems to be, what is the message or what is the movie about? But of course what the media ecologist wants to know is how media as environments work, how they structure what we see and say and therefore do, and how this structuring changes as the media themselves move from one environment to another. A very difficult task. But the difficulty of it has not stopped us from asking some pretty big questions. For instance, in what ways does technology generate social change? What are the consequences of new communication environments from computers to communes for education, politics, literature, and religion? In what ways do speeded up communication environments affect interpersonal relationships? What role does language itself play in conserving social institutions? Well, in trying to answer these questions, our ecological paradigm has been excitingly useful. But lest you start wondering where are all the question marks I promised, let me say now that we have been unable so far to develop a workable taxonomy. Our theories such as they are are woefully weak, sometimes tautological or simply trivial. Our methods of context analysis are still gross and eclectic. The results of our analyses are frequently so complex that we hardly know how to organize what we have observed. There are times, frankly, when we wish that communication was, after all, just a chunk of stuff. But, of course, we carry on. And by we, I mean mostly the students in our program. And before concluding, I would like to say a word about them. To begin with, I have the impression that I was probably invited here not so much to talk about communication but to say something about communication education. Well, although it may not have sounded like it, I think I have. You see, the fact that media ecology is in such an underdeveloped condition makes it all the more useful in schools at all levels as an approach to communication. Media ecology is not yet a subject and may not be one for decades still to come. Media ecology is a field of inquiry, and fields of inquiry imply the active pursuit of knowledge, discoveries, explorations, errors, uncertainty, change, new questions, new terms, new definitions. In short, media ecology is itself an open system, which, as I see it, should be the main characteristic of all the curriculums of the future. A subject, on the other hand, is too often closed. It seems to imply a well-ordered and stable content, a parceling out of information, an act of ventriloquizing someone else's answers to someone else's questions. But in media ecology, 
We offer students an environment, including a paradigm, that permits them to think and invent in ways that are too often closed to them in more settled disciplines or approaches. In a way, you can say that students in media ecology and other underworld enterprises will be the knowledge organizers of the future, no matter how tentative their scholarship must be now. Which reminds me of the wonderful exchange between Justice Holmes and John Dewey, a sort of paradigm itself for life in the academic underworld. Justice Holmes said, Professor Dewey, I think your early writing was clearer than your later writing. Yes, said Dewey, then I was digging down three inches. Now I'm trying to dig three feet. Ah, yes, said Holmes. When I've stopped thinking, I'm very lucid. <laughs> well, I would sincerely like to invite any of you who are willing to forego lucidity to help us or join us in our digging. Thank you very much.